Welcome to Redirect Immigration Law and Perspectives, a weekly dive into the world of immigration law and its human consequences. I'm here with Matthew Archambault, co-host. Don't don't do that in the intro. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. I'm excited. Matthew, it felt a little weird yesterday. I grew up very religious and you learn to sort of feel guilty sometimes about everything. Like if you if you feel good, then it's probably wrong and you feel guilty. And I felt a little bit guilty for being so happy. I don't know. Did you get any of that? No, not at all. Okay. I mean, this whole week has been, was it Tuesday when we had, was it Monday or Tuesday? We had the LGBT decision uh-huh. right, from the right. Supreme Court where they came up with this radical idea that people shouldn't be able to be fired for being gay or transgender. Uh-huh. Local talk radio, very worried about that one. Yeah. Well, for me, who has a transgender son, that makes me feel really happy. It makes me feel a lot more positive about this country than I have been feeling, knowing that he can grow up and be fired only for being a f- up. Right. Which is great. Just like his dad. But not not for being transgender or gay, you know? Right. So Just for having terrible genes and coming from a bad father who didn't teach him. Exactly. Exactly. And then we were kind of on edge for on that day, right? Because we thought Doc might come out. Right. And I think we got this pleasant surprise. So I was very happy. I, I, I cried. I'll be honest. Wow, look at you. And then yesterday, we got the DACA decision, which I had, I guess I kind of put it out of my head. I I was thinking about it in the morning, then I got caught up doing things. And um, around 1030, I went on Twitter and like everyone was talking about it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Right. I think the vast majority of us were very surprised by it and very happy about it. So, right. yeah, but no, I didn't feel I didn't feel bad for being happy. I okay. felt very good for being happy. I, I wasn't raised in a very religious household. Maybe that's, that's a, a weird story. residual from my my upbringing, maybe. Not that I had a bad upbringing. Like, my childhood was great. Shout out to my mom. <laughs> uh, so, actually, Luis Cortez is joining us. He's uh, making the rounds. Yesterday, I texted him and was like, how come he hasn't texted me back? And then I literally am scrolling through Twitter and he's on Jake Tapper. So, you know... I yeah, understand. He had a busy day and he's probably going to have a busy day for the near future. So good yeah. for him. I do want to say we, we said thanks at the end. Thank you for your hard work or whatever. But, you know, when Luis would talk to us about this case and the APA and Bert Bernan and this and that, you know, I'm a lawyer. I went to law school, uh, <laughs> but my eyes would just kind of glaze over. I'm not even really sure, you know, I'll- I'll send you an email about what the APA is later. (laughs) Well, what I mean is like the case hinged on these highly technical, really smart arguments. And I'm a dumb guy. So if it were me arguing DACA, I would be like, DACA is good and it helps a lot of people. So uh, maybe you should give it back to them. And it turns out that argument would not have (laughs) would not have gone very far. So I'm anyways, the, the point is to say I'm grateful for Luis and other smart lawyers like him who make things like this possible. So, yeah, when you, when you're in the lawyer game, you see like there are different levels of lawyers, right? Oh, totally. Right. Like you got the ones that are kind of scraping the bottom. And I'm going to say with all humility, that's not me or Steven. But then you see guys like Luis and the guys that go up to the Supreme Court and those guys are like they're playing in NBA it means oh, Stephen yeah. are in the D League. Now we have our moments, right? Right. Mm-hmm. But no, we're not. We're not. We're not there. You're like Antoine Walker in the in the D League, though, because you're old and <laughs> crafty. <laughs> oh no, I wasn't gonna say crafty. I he, he's one of my least favorite basketball <laughs> players of all time. By the way, just so you know. So thank well, you. Yeah, there you go. And I'm more like you know a prospect. Like NBA teams are looking, you know, but when you're playing, it's more like you spend so all your saying money. You're kind of like a Shake Milton. <laughs> when you're playing in the D League, it's more like, you know, sad and pathetic. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm okay. sorry. 
I just had to be mean for a second. It's okay. No, but you're totally right. I've been in CLEs before, continuing legal education seminars where like one of these smart lawyers will start talking and I I honestly feel like maybe I'm having a stroke. Like (laughs) maybe I'm in the wrong place. Am I supposed to be here? I don't understand what we're talking about. I don't understand where we are. Anyways, so DACA survives, but it survives only thanks to the MBA of lawyers. And not just the NBA, we're talking like all NBA, right? All NBA. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But also, right, and, and uh, Luis mentions this, this is really about the activists who gave us DACA. You know, right. It wasn't the lawyers, it was activists, ones who went out in the streets, who went into congressional offices, who really held, you know, Obama's feet to the fire. And they're the ones that are going to transform DACA from this temporary thing to something more permanent which I do think will happen eventually. So, right. so a big shout out to them. I have all the respect in the world for them. They, they did what lawyers could not do. Just real quick, we talked about this at the very end. I think a lot of people were ready to hit the streets to sort of have a fusion of movements, Black Lives Matter and Dreamers and, and immigration activists uh, hitting the streets to protest the termination of DACA. And this decision is great, but it also sort of I think takes the wind out of the sails of some of those uh, uh, energies. And and I I really want to encourage people to not let that happen, to keep pushing. There's going to be this theme. I'm seeing it already with my congressman that like, well, with DACA in place, our hands are totally tied. We can't come up with a solution, which is like, there's nothing to that, right? That's like, basically they're afraid. They're too cowardly. So keep pushing your representatives for a real permanent solution. I mean, the DREAM Act has existed for 20 years. It's not like they need to come together and and write something new like it exists. So keep pushing, take to the streets, protest, do what you need to do legally. For sure. All right, Matthew, I guess we'll... uh, Continue on with this show. Continue on with the show. It was good talking to you and we'll talk to you next week. All right, Luis, there's... um, Literally not a show that you haven't done. So we're going to need something juicy, something different. Please try and think a little outside of the box, as we will in our line of questioning. So for starters, how does it feel? Oh, God. (laughs) How's everybody's day yesterday? Does it feel good? (laughs) It, it, uh, you know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) All right. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, (laughs) We just wanted to see how it feels. And um, yeah, well, thanks for coming on, Luis. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right, listen, guys. Now, Luis, I do want to say one thing that must feel good because that's what we want to focus on how you're, you are personally feeling. You had expressed to me some anxiety about obviously your your life and your future and all those things, but also being the face of a massive loser if the case went the other way and being called to do all these shows and to talk about how and why you lost. Oh boy. How and why you lost my mic stand just went limp. <laughs> um and now you don't have to do that. So that does have to feel pretty good, right? It's a bit relieving that I don't have to explain the loss. And not just to people to understand, to understand it doctrinally, but for it to, you know, to have to explain to hundreds of thousands of people what happened. And, it, you know, I was bracing to have that, like, letdown. So, right. Are you the guy that no, lost you- the DACA case? Are you? Are you the- yeah. That guy? yeah. I mean, you said you didn't lose, but I would like to point to a, A recent tweet from our leader. In part, he says, based on the decision, the Dems can't make DACA citizens. They gain nothing. This is from Donald Trump. So I think it's a fair point that sounds like you kind of got nothing. Nothing. How do you respond? Yeah. I mean, it's a great legal analysis, by the way. So, yeah, I was particularly, well, first of all, he first tweeted that he, he said something like, do you have a sense that the Supreme Court doesn't like me? <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. I'm not gonna. I thought I, 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 <laughs> I thought that was a. a bit funny. I think that's his best tweet of his uh, 
president's <laughs> yeah. career, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did find that pretty humorous. But then he said that, you know, the decision was a shotgun blast to the face of anybody who considers themselves a Republican or conservative, which I thought was a bit extreme. <laughs> Call that Dick Cheney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but like, I mean, this isn't the first time that we see President Trump venting on Twitter based on a decision. And, you know, he did say have some, him and DHS have some very strong words against the decision, but nothing that provided any real substance. It seemed like just venting about a, a loss. And once the kind of dust settles a little bit, the cooler heads may prevail within the DOJ. Uh, he did say something about, you know, he's he's going to have to start this over and that's one of the critiques that I saw right away, even from some of the immigration, you know, immigration law colleagues that they're like, well, this isn't really a victory because he can just go back and do it again. And this gave him essentially just a roadmap to just terminate DACA the right way and blah, blah, blah. You know, and I think that kind of perspective really misses the broader point here. And it's a bit myopic mm. because, first of all. What the decision says, it's a procedural-based decision, right? The argument never was that he couldn't terminate the program. We knew that from the beginning. The argument was that he didn't do it the right way, and the court agreed. And so one of the reasons that this is important is because if he's going to go back and do it again the right way, he has to follow the APA, which takes time. And first, it's not going to happen before November. So he's going to have to then try to terminate a program during the election a program that is overwhelmingly supported by America across political ideologies. Right. And so he's going to have to do that. Second is by following the APA, and this is what Chief Justice Roberts laid out very, very, very clearly, is, is that he has to take into account all of what's happening and the consequences and then weigh that against the policy of ending the program, which is up to his discretion, and explain it. And then, you know, make a decision. And so what it, what it means is that he's going to have to take the health of the American people, the, the economy, and then, you know, we're still in a pandemic and we have not just essential workers, but healthcare workers that are DACA recipients. So he's going to have to justify all of that publicly mm -hmm. and then try to and terminate the program. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. It seemed a bit unlikely that DOJ is going to want to have egg on their face twice on this case, at least in such a close matter. So it's entirely possible that if President Trump wins a second election, then he very well could terminate the program. Though, to be fair, if he wins a second election, I do feel like we have other issues on our hands, structurally too. And so for now, it's a humongous win. And, and the other part of it too is, is that there's a mini generation of people who were unable to apply for the program because it was terminated. And these are people who are about to graduate high school now. And are you talking about people that are small in stature? Like they're short, not large people. <laughs> yeah, just a, there's, a, there's a number of just short people. <laughs> so there's going to be some benefit to it. And, and here's my la right. last point to this. And then I... Oh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. well, I was just going to clarify. So in order to apply for DACA, you had to be 15. So there's a whole bunch of people who met all the criteria, but in 2017, when the program was, when they tried to terminate it, they were maybe 14 and 10 months or 13 or 12 or whatever. Those people are now 15, 16, 17. They meet all the other criteria for DACA, but they haven't been able to apply because it was terminated. And, and these people now presumably can apply. That's right. And I mean, I've talked to people who the DACA program was terminated three or four days before their birthday, before their 15th birthday. So they just missed it. So it does provide some of the protections, at least for first time applicants, which is a humongous deal. One of the things that, that I think is most important, I think this is lost amongst a lot of practitioners because they look at it very practically is the, the critique about DACA is that it's temporary, right? That there's a temporary reprieve. And so that we need a, a permanent solution. And of course we do. Nobody wants to live like this. But what I think people miss out on is, is that even though it does provide a temporary benefit of this work permit, it provides a permanent change to a person's soul once that sort of Damocles, that's the threat of deportation. It, it's hard to explain. It's, once I got my DACA and I didn't have to worry at least for a little while about being deported, I didn't realize how heavy that was until I didn't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it permanently changed 
how I viewed things, how I felt. It was, there was an empowerment that it's a genie you can't put back in the bottle. Even if the two year work permit, you know, doesn't stick around, that change is, is profound. And I think a lot of people just skip on that. Right. And so, of course, of course, we need a permanent solution. There is another critique of, you know, well, this is going to stop Congress from acting. And, but, you know, maybe I don't subscribe to that suicide vest kind of strategy because, you know, we saw with the pandemic that, yeah, Congress acted on the, on when we had a, an emergency, a national emergency, which I think the deportation of dreamers will become a national emergency. But there's a lot of people who fell off the cliff before there was any kind of protection. And even the protection did provide in a haphazard way was far from perfect. So I don't know why we can't do both. This is a humongous, humongous win, not just for the immigrant community, but for the immigrant rights community. Because again, I've said this a billion times over, the DACA was a product of a sustained movement from a intense activism. And so not just to get Obama to fold on it, but then to protect it from Donald Trump is a huge, huge win. Right. And so, you know, to the critiques out there, I think that that's a different perspective. Now, but don't, don't you think we owe a, a huge shout out to Elaine Duke for like writing such a crappy memo? You know, I thought about Elaine Duke a lot yesterday because I thought about there's obviously a lot of people at DOJ who are good professionals, career civil servants who are struggling right now. He has to say this. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I, I think about Secretary Duke and her trying to, you know, what we know from, what we now know what happened that day at the White House when she had like this political ambush and was wanting to, you know, force to try to end this program. Who knows if Secretary Duke ended up doing it on purpose, but for a second, it really did shed some light about having, you know, good professionals in, in the government who I think who can try to mitigate some damage, whether it's purposefully or not, you know, and I, there is something to be said about that. And, and, you know, the other thing that I think about it too, is that Secretary Duke was so correctly, so she was so hesitant to put her name on the termination of the DACA memo because she knew that she did not want her name on that. And so she, she ended up kind of passing it over to Jeff Sessions. And I think this time around where DACA has just gained even more support. I think DHS might have a difficult time trying to get someone to actually sign that memo again. Maybe not. Maybe Cuccinelli would do it. I think Ken Cuccinelli should write it. <laughs> I think he's earned it. I think he deserves it. I think he should be the one to sit in the office and write that memo. Uh -huh. That's my, uh, I think that will work out well for all parties. Oh, well, maybe our party. They got to make sure he's got enough crayons, but. <laughs> no, he's good. I sent him some. So let me ask you this, Luis. So in 2012, when the program was announced, it was a very common question people had because that was also an election year. And a lot of people were like, what happens if Mitt Romney wins? What's going to happen to DACA? And I'm not like a, one of these guarantee -y kind of lawyers. Not going to happen. Yeah, okay. But what I would tell people is, look, Obama's not doing this because he's necessarily like a super great guy. He's doing it because it's popular. And it is overwhelmingly popular. So it would be really weird if a president came along and ended it after, you know, it was already in, in place. And there's just not really a precedent for that. And then it happened. And so we're now in this strange window yeah. where, you, you know, you talked about this mini generation and the psychological and emotional benefits to coming out of the shadows and having your presence legitimized legally. but what would you say to the people who now have, I guess, that same concern they might've had in 2012, but I mean, really on steroids, right? That's right. From a doctrinal standpoint, like what we're looking at in terms of the lawsuit and the law, one of the claims that we raised, so, and it was, we're the only party who had raised it. So I know that there was a different amount of lawsuits that all caught consolidated into one, but the Garcia versus Trump case is the only one who raised the information sharing component to the lawsuit where the Department of Homeland Security, well, USCIS, has said that they were not going to share that information with ICE. Now, we now know that they've changed their tune, and that is not entirely true. So what we had prepared to do, again, we were preparing for, you know, I agree with a lot of people, we were preparing for the worst. And so one of the things that we started to do is we started to get ready to go back into court immediately. 
in case DACA ended to stop DHS from sharing any information to ICE because that was part of their memo. And so as we're going to see the DACA program open back up in its full swing, we're going to keep a very vigilant eye in what DHS is doing. And then we're going to see what kind of guidance comes from the department to see what they're going to see. Because I can, I can see a situation where they are now going to change their memorandum so that the initial applications filed now omit any kind of language that says that they're not going to share information with ICE. And so then we would need to mm. act accordingly. But it's hard. I mean... It's a tough decision because either you apply for the program and you get it, but you risk in cases of the election or you don't. Right. Thankfully, that's not a legal question that I generally have to answer for the clients. It's a risk question that they have to answer. Right. And I don't know if there is a right answer. Yeah. I, I usually tell people that they're sort of only considering the risk of one side of the equation, which is, uh, you know, applying and having the information shared. But it seems to me that not applying is also not risk free. And there's, good things and bad things about not applying, I guess. Talk about the actual decision, because we have the president saying that the the court didn't agree with him because they don't like him. And I don't know if that's actually in the decision or not. Can you, (laughs) what what is the the court saying? Yeah. So it's a five, four decision. And the decision was penned by chief justice Roberts. And I, and I was, I was a bit surprised by the decision because the decision itself ultimately is ruled on kind of really old black letter law of uh, APA that if the government is going to act, you know, the executive branch has broad authority in in some of its cabinet decision making powers, but it's not, you know, the authority is not unlimited. One of the biggest checks and balances on it is the APA and to let the public scrutinize the reasons that you change the uh, policy and then people will have to make decisions come November. But, you know, one of the the things that the decision really came down to, the two things that surprised me was it was uh, almost like a win for the presidency and a loss for President Trump because it did provide and confirm that there was broad authority to, to end this program but just not the way that he did it. That's really kind of what the decision turned on. What I found a bit more surprising is that there was an equal protection claim that we had brought on whether the, the decision to end DACA was based on racial animus. Now, by the time we got to the Supreme Court, there was a significant change in legal landscape because the Hawaii versus Trump case came out. And that changed how we could use political speech into infer racial animus. Though it wasn't, it wasn't on all fours with that. So there still was something to be argued, I would say. But by and large, that argument seemed to have been largely foreclosed by Hawaii. So by the time we got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court didn't really ask about it. It wasn't really briefed on the papers. It wasn't on the government's brief. It wasn't in our brief. And so we kind of just left it. And the decision to ultimately decides the case on the APA, but Chief Justice Roberts goes out and says, that he he also denies it on the equal protection claim, which I thought was very surprising because one of the very basic components of judicial modesty is to not comment on the Constitution if you don't have to. Mm-hmm. And to, for him to to then say like, yeah, well, we're going to decide this on the APA and then we're going to go out and, you know, it kind of seemed like he gratuitously mentions the equal protection claim. I found that very surprising and a bit awkward. And I have uh, Justice Sotomayor, she was the only one who wrote in her dissenting opinion about race and about the, the equal protection claim. And she said, you know, this is a case that was brought to the Supreme Court as a threshold matter, right? It's in a preliminary injunction. So to Justice Sotomayor, we showed enough of a claim to proceed on the merits, which is, you know, the question. I have a sense that the reason that Chief Justice Roberts went on and also decided it on the equal protection claim is to give a, a bit of a finality to the case and not remanded because this case reminds me a lot about the census case, even in the reaction of President Trump, where he, he was, it's very similar. He said, we're not saying you can't put the citizenship question there. We're saying you just can't do it the way you do it. So lie better next time was essentially what the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Roberts was saying. The thing is, is that on remand on that case, there was a lot of shenanigans that was happening with the White House that the Department of Justice lawyers got in a lot of trouble for. And it was one of the cases where there was a kind of en masse quit by the Department of Justice lawyers that we had never seen before. And so I think Chief Justice Roberts, and it is me reading the tea leaves, I don't know, right? But I think Chief Justice Roberts wanted to end the case now and say, you know, we're not going to kick this back down and have the White House, you know, try to mess around with this again and tinker with it again. If they're going to want to do it, they're going to have to do it from the beginning. Let's just end it now. Mm -hmm. 
but it was very, very peculiar for Chief Justice Roberts to comment on the Constitution when he didn't have to. Hmm. So, Luis, one of the things I've seen is, and some of it is from, I guess, our side and others might be maybe wishful thinking from the other side, that this case is going to make it really hard for, say, a Biden presidency or a not Trump presidency to undo stuff that he's been doing. Do you see any problems in that? For example, end the name MPP, would, would this affect efforts to try to end that program? No, I don't think so, because the case here doesn't necessarily provide any new legal doctrines where the White House and his administration or the administration is bound by any new laws. Ultimately, what the case says is that you have to follow the laws that exist. Um, so Biden was going to have to follow the APA too. And, but he's also limited by the APA. He's not going to be able to do all that he wants. And I have a particularly jaundiced eye against Vice President Biden because he comes from the Obama administration and he likes to align himself with Obama quite a bit. And so he was part of the deportation machine, as far as I'm concerned. He just announced recently, you know, that his first day in office, he's going to provide a legislation to Congress. And well, you had all the Obama years to do that. And instead, you deported more people than any other administration did. So we'll see about that. But, you know, in terms of just his limitations, it, it doesn't necessarily going to limit him. He just has to play by the same APA rule book that every other government has to play with. Uh, if he's being realistic about it, he needs to be working on it now and start to get some of these contingencies in place, including who his cabinet is going to be so that they can act appropriately, but swiftly. Right. Yeah, I, I think we may see if he wins, maybe not quite the drastic rollback that we all would hope, but we shall see. So let me ask you a political question, because it's a weird situation where from the beginning you were arguing that they just did it wrong, right? That in other words, that there was a correctable mistake and yet they chose to litigate it rather than that's right. simply do the thing that you you were in court saying that's right people keep saying that justice roberts laid out a a, a roadmap but really it was you guys who laid out the roadmap yep. you guys were the ones that's in right. court saying here's how daca should have been terminated and it wasn't and the decision to not correct but to litigate strikes me as a political calculation where they were sort of happy to appease the, you know, give a little bit of red meat to their base by ending the program, That's right. but also happy to sort of have it continue and not have to face the actual consequences of their, of their actions. I understand the conservative mind through the prism of my local talk radio <laughs> and in listening to how they covered it, it was sort of like, oh, you know, the, the court says he can end it, but just differently. And there was maybe one caller who, who was upset that, you know, Justice Roberts is like a flaming liberal, but for the most part, it doesn't seem to be something that resonates even with my super racist talk radio, the ending DACA, I mean. And so, I mean, what's your sense of, of just how bad they, they actually want it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. They've had the ability to rewrite this decision this entire time. And in fact, when part of the litigation happened in the East Coast, they in the Second Circuit, and one of the judges ordered for Christian Nielsen to uh, essentially do better. She still didn't get it right, and so uh, when forced to do so, and so I think that they really wanted to be at arm's length with ending this program, and they really wanted to say the Supreme Court agreed with us that it was illegal, and you know our hands are tied, and let you know. And, it's clear from what we know now from all the reporting that the White House was planning to use the ending of DACA as a political bargaining chip saying, look, we'll do a deal, but I want a wall and all these other things. And it just, it's really backfiring. And, and I think one of the things that you pointed out, Stephen, is this is not a liberal court by any stretch of the imagination. This is a very, very, very conservative Supreme Court. And so it's not that Chief Justice Roberts is a, is a liberal, is is that the actions of President Trump's administrations are so bad that even a very, very conservative court can't agree with them. Right. Right. On, on like some basic procedural stuff, like do your job. <laughs> right, right. I and mean, Chief Justice Roberts worked for a long time in the office of the legal counsel, which is the attorneys for the president. So he, one of his first decisions that he heard as chief justice 
was about executive authority. And so, you know, he, he's one that has, you know, that believes, at least from a judicial perspective, that the executive has broad authority in certain things, particularly in immigration. So, you know, Chief Justice Roberts was, by all accounts, you know, someone that would agree with President Trump, but that, that's how bad of a job it was. Right. Let me ask, this is uh, getting a little bit into the weeds in terms of like what's next. So the, the case was remanded to DHS. I'm not sure exactly to do what you said. And, and I think I agree with you that we're now back to pre September, whatever, 2017 DACA where mm-hmm. they can take new applications, advance parole, I'm assuming. Yep. But if I were to file, <laughs> This is very much a lawyer question. If I were to file an application today, I mean, what does DHS do with it? And, and why, why is it remanded to them? I think that there's a decision that was made, right? That was made yesterday. Ultimately, what's going to give the, the, the decision weight is the mandate. And so the Supreme Court issues its mandate generally 21 days after. And same thing, you know, if anybody does circuit court work, you know, you get the decision, you, know, you get the mandate after. And so... The USCIS certainly is not compelled to accept the applications until the mandate is issued, and they may wait to do so, again, for political posturing. But until then, you know, I would wait and see till we have guidance from the Department of Homeland Security, just because they are going to accept applications and the program. I mean, the determination the, the of the program is what was struck down. So the program as it existed before is what's going to continue unless they change the memorandum. I can certainly see a situation where they're tweaking the memorandum of DACA to now provide some exceptions and, you know, things like that of, again, maybe information sharing or, or slight tweaks. So the decision, even though it came down yet, the legal teeth on it is still yet to come down. Now, there's really no sense, like logical sense of why the department will wait until the mandate comes down. You know, the decision's a decision. And there's oftentimes uh, situations where the government starts acting before the mandate. But I think Given the comments of DHS and the president, they might wait until the 21 days before they start accepting new applications. Interesting. So to what degree are they allowed to tinker with it? I mean, you know, at what point does it become a fundamentally different program? Program. Yeah, it's it's a matter of degree, I think. You know, I, I don't know if it's the amount of changes rather than the type of changes and to do one big change and that could be it. So we're going to keep a close eye on it. We're going to keep a very close eye on it. We're not done. And one thing I'll mention too is my start here with this DACA litigation started before the, the program was rescinded. It started with Daniel Ramirez, who was picked up, his DACA was taken away. And since then, the government has said that they don't care that they got it wrong, that he was not a gang member. That's ostensibly why they did it. They can end his DACA just because they want to, and they don't need a reason. They can just do any reason or no reason, according to the Department of Homeland Security. Daniel's case is now at the Ninth Circuit. And I think Daniel's case is now important now more than ever, because even though the structural components of the DACA programs are in place, I am a bit worried that the Department of Homeland Security will start plucking of people one by one, and it will be the death of by a thousand paper cuts that we thought was going to happen in February of 2017. And so if the government is permitted to terminate the program for any reason now or no reason, I'm worried that that's how ultimately they're going to do it. So Daniel's case, that's at the Ninth Circuit, is going to provide, again, those safeguards on an individual basis as to what the government can and can't do. Right. So I, I'm very much looking forward to continue. I mean, our, our DACA fight is not anywhere near over, we're going to keep a very close eye on what the department is going to do and how they're going to do it. And then, you know, we're going to continue fighting for Daniel's case so that the government doesn't do this on an individual basis. So you could see a situation where, for example, DHS begrudgingly says, okay, DACA still exists, but um, hey, look at this guy. He uh, he has DACA. And we looked at his uh, reckless driving conviction which was pled down from a DUI arrest. And we had granted it before, but now we've, we've had a change of heart. We actually think that that's super bad. We're going to... That's exactly right. In Daniel's case, Daniel got his DACA reinstated because the court told him, you guys got this wrong and you keep calling him a gang member. There's no evidence of that. And so they reinstated it. Then they terminated his DACA for infractions, for infractions. Mm. And infractions that you don't even have to put in your application. And we have an email from the Department of Homeland Security, from one of the USCIS officers that says, we have never terminated a, a guy's application for this. And they terminated it anyway. Mm. And it's not just these prohibitive measures. I mean, like we're going to see a hike 
in price increase. You know, I think that there's going to be different measures that are going to ultimately attempt to prohibit people from applying for DACA or get it terminated. And one of the things that I was particularly concerned about uh, on the proposed regulations to streamline deportations on asylum seekers is that for a lot of DACA recipients who don't have U.S. citizen family members, which is a big chunk of them, if they get placed in removal proceedings, the mechanics of the removal proceedings will not permit them to really apply for much relief except for maybe asylum. But of course, the proposed regulations that happened about two weeks ago attempt to strip asylum seekers from any procedural safeguards and streamline their deportation. Right. And so we were going to see a situation where DACA ends, DACA recipients are placed in removal proceedings, and then they're now expedited into their deportations. And so these are some of the kind of mechanics that we need to keep our eye on. So, I mean, as far as yesterday is concerned, we will take that humongous victory, but we're going to keep a close eye on all the other parts of of the uh, Rubik's Cube to make sure that DACA recipients can continue to apply for DACA and receive it. Now, are you worried that your appearances on this podcast may be held in as a as a negative discretionary factor for you? <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, uh, I <laughs> may, we'll it, see. It's actually a broader <laughs> question, and I actually get it from some of my DACA clients who who become politically active. They worry about blowback for that reason. Yeah, I mean, it's not unfounded. And Stephen and I have talked about a few of his clients, and I think he's mentioned it on the show, that for people who are without DACA protections and they speak out against ICE, that ICE has then come, said, oh, that's how we found out about you. And obsessively, it's not retaliatory. They're just saying we're just enforcing the law on the books, but they're enforcing the law on, on this guy because he spoke out. One of the things that I, and this is more of a personal perspective, you know, as DACA recipients, we have a protection that some people who are undocumented don't have, you know, a, a quite a bit of privilege. And so I think it behooves us to be more outspoken because there's a lot of people who don't even have the DACA protections who are more scared than, than we are. So, you know, if we're in a position of privilege, just I think anybody's in a position who is in a position of privilege, then we should use that to help the people who aren't. And so for us DACA recipients who have these protections, I think it's on us to, to speak out. Right. So, well, I have two questions, I guess. I have about two minutes left to accept that 730. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so at what point would you recommend people apply? Should we wait for DHS to, you know, release guidance or instructions? Or do you think people should just uh, hop right on it? Dust off those cover letters. Yeah. I think that the, in terms of order of operations is that people need to get getting their paperwork ready. Right. Though that paperwork takes a while. Maybe some people are already ready. But, you know, they should they should start getting that paperwork ready and making sure that all of that is prepared. Start looking into getting the filing fee. There is now some funds that are starting to to pay for filing fees. But I would wait until we get department guidance to see how they're going to do that. There might be a, a change in the form. There might be I don't know. And so I would say get all the documents ready and, and wait and see to see what happens. But one of the things I'm most excited about is advanced parole. Advanced parole is coming back too. And so right. uh, I'm about to go visit Alma and I'm in, in, in Montreal. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, the border's closed, dude. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I try to go to Montreal too, but at least that's what Alma keeps telling me. The border's closed. Wait, I should check into that. <laughs> she just tells you. <laughs> so, 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 so sorry. The border's closed. You can't come visit. <laughs> He's been telling Matthew that since before the pandemic. So. <laughs> all right Luis thank you so much for your time we really appreciate it and thanks again for all your hard work on that case and congratulations this is awesome we appreciate thanks. it thanks everybody 